I would like to take this opportunity and the pleasure to welcome Dr. Salim al Ruzehi, Chairman of the Board of Oman Information Technology, to deliver a keynote. Dr. Salim is a known figure for the information communication technology and most certainly to COMEX, the technology event of the Sultanate of Oman for over 30 years. Dr. Salim has worked with the ministry when ICT authority, the Information Technology Authority was formed. He was at the helm of establishing Oman's e-government, Oman's digital transformation at the government level, and of course, collaborating with the industry. I had the pleasure to work with Dr. Salim since he was the CEO of ITA, and I continue to learn and we continue to benefit from his leadership. Dr. Salim contributes to the ICT industry since he was the CEO in 2006, and he continues to do that. Now, Dr. Salim is the chairman of the Oman Information Technology Society, and Dr. Salim's ambition, as we have seen always, is to make Oman at the leader position in adapting technologies, especially the fourth industrial revolution, to improve people's life, and to provide opportunities to the youth and to bring investors and the visitors to the Sultanate of Oman. Without further ado, I request Dr. Salim al to please deliver his keynote. Dr. Salim. Thank you very much for this uh, nice words. Um, I'm really delighted uh, to, to be with you. Your Excellency, uh, Dr. Bakhit uh, Ahmed Al-Mahri, Under Secretary for Ministry of Higher Education, Research and Innovation for Higher Education, it's a long name. Um, uh, Your Excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, good morning to all of you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Sadallah sabahakum wa kul khair. I'm really delighted to be part of this gathering. I'm really uh, I'm glad to see a lot of uh, you know, uh, friends, uh, and also uh, delighted to meet new friends in this in this new gathering. I'd like to thank the organizer for making this happen. And uh, I think there's it takes a lot of excellent work to make this event after after uh, the COVID issue. And everyone, I think, is very uh, you know delighted to be back to face uh, uh, gathering and. Uh, Sorry, this is uh, uh, of course, you know, this event uh, will be focusing on the skills of the future and HRD. And I know that we have great, you know, people here who will be talking and also discussing this, this important points here. I will be more focusing on the part of the ICT part of the future, future skills. Uh, as you I said, you know, today ICT is into is, is actually impacting every sector, um, impacting every job, and we know that, you know, from from our from our experience here in in, in different sectors, people are keen to see the dis to, to see, see the, the disruption, disruption. and um, they are, they are very, really very. Uh, uh, a lot of people are very afraid also for for the impact of this technology on their jobs also. So I think uh, what there's a lot of uh, even organization today. They are they are really very uh, confused also, or very uh, uh, we can we can say struggling with what type of skills they need for the future. Ourself is also people are struggling to say what really skills that I need you know for to to be relative also for in in a, in, a, in in the future in the future and to be part of this organization. Um, so what is, so what are the skills of the future that we need for us to be relevant today to today and tomorrow? And if, if I can also look at uh, asking a lot of people, maybe we should do a survey uh, to the people around us here to say, are they worried of technology impacting their, their jobs? Because when we look at the, some studies for a study uh, conducted by uh, PwC on uh, workforce of future, they're talking about 37% of the people are worried 
that this the technology will impact their life, impact their future, impact their jobs. But the, the good uh, sign also there's and uh, there's seventy three percent of people think the technology will not really uh, it will it have an impact, but they are willing to you know to to work with the technology, and I think the technology will not replace people. And this is I agree with the, with this you know with with uh, with the concept of that we need to reskill people for, 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 for the future. I think 70%, according to this study, 70% of the people think they can reskill themselves. They can still uh, ready to learn new skills. So I think if, if we, now I'm you know, sending these messages to the, to the policymakers, because this is very, very, very important, uh, you know, statistics, and we are not away from, you know, from uh, the global uh, trends and the global market. So those, those statistics, statistics are very important to, to the, to the policymaker to say, okay, uh, you know, uh, I, uh, I am a public, uh, I've been working in the public sector for all my life. I, I was not a part of the private sector, but I know reskilling was an issue in the, in, the, in the public sector. And I hope that we have some people here from our colleagues in the public sector to realize that, you know, for the future, reskilling is really a must for, for, our, for our, you know, uh, people you know, to move forward and to be, to be part of the uh, new trends and, new, uh, and, and also to, to welcome the adoption of new technologies, AI, uh, robotics, whatever technology that we're talking about today. So it is, it is essential for policymakers to, re to realize there is two, two, two aspects of this. One aspect is reskilling and reskilling people and making people ready. And uh, as you see from the survey, people are ready to, you know, to adapt technology. They are ready to, uh, to welcome a robot next to them and they are ready to work with, with, with technology and, and, and deliver their services, deliver their responsibility in a better way, in a more efficient, in a cost-effective way. But we, we, we have to make sure that everyone has to realize that, you know, uh, there's a certain people who can skill themselves. They, are, they know how to move forward and this, but this is, this is, it has to be, you know, it has to be systematic or it has to be part of a policy. You cannot have an organization skilling their people where the other organization is not, is not doing anything in, the, in that areas. And so automation, robotics, processing, AI, uh, all these technologies is going to impact us. No, no, no matter what, what we say, but again, if we are willing to learn we are willing to reskill ourselves. We are willing to move forward. I think this is this is the case. According to W, the World Economic Forum, uh, all those revolutions, it will impact the jobs, yes, but it will create more jobs. So if we look at it from 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 uh, the impact, yes, there is impact for certain jobs, uh, like what the, our colleagues, the, th the thirty-seven percent, are saying that they they think they will be replaced. Yes, they will be replaced. But the kind of revolution, and this is a history of other re revolutions, revolution user usually create growth, it, it grow the job. There is more jobs is created than job lost. According to the, the World Economic Forum, 58 million extra job will be created. So what is, what is the impact of that, that important you know, uh, piece of data for, for us as a policymaker? It is very, very important that we, we realize that you know, uh, from the policy making point of view, we, are, we know that 65, according to this report, 65% of the kids in school now, they, work in, they will work in a job that are not available today. So if, if these kids are going to work in a job that's not created today, and we still have about more than 58 million job will be created, extra job, you know, in addition to the job that we lose, we'll create another 58 million job. We are part of a, the whole global world. It's not, we are not, you know, in isolation from, from the world. So whatever it impacts the, the world, it will impact us as, as in, in one way or another. So, so this piece of information, again, what, what are we think, talking about if we are, you know, policymakers? What we need to do in, 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 in terms of the policy for the future? Your Excellency, the education for the scholarship of the future. What 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 is? I'm, I'm glad you are here because this is this is very important. This is a very very important uh, 
uh, topics today. So what what are what are the areas that we we need to focus on as 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 a policymaker today? Not not only in the in the in the education in the higher education, but also in the in the in, in our you know basic education as in the in the in the future. All of us, I think, uh, here uh, we are very keen, you know, to 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 uh, to uh, improve the work environment in our in our uh, you know uh, organization. But also, I think the, the most important thing for this gathering is how can we have a national you know a national policy for 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 to move forward in, the, in this in these areas. Everyone is contributing, and I think uh, also. Uh, if we look at the public sector, the private sector, uh, the societies like ourselves, يعني, everyone is contributing to this, to solve this issue. Uh, the, for example, the YTS today, we, we, we are launching several initiatives. Uh, we launched uh, uh, a cyber security AMAN initiative for the whole year to build capacity and create, you know, a lot of awareness about, you know, cyber security, which is a very important, very important, you know, topic and a very important future topic also. But also we, we, we also launched another uh, initiative called Maharatik, again, to develop the skills of people in technologies that we think are very, very important for now and the future in the areas of cybersecurity, artificial intelligence, data analytics, and other, other programming and others, other, other certification for people, you know, for, for people who are looking for a job, but also for people to improve their 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 uh, their skills in in these technologies the most important thing for for all of us here as as uh, you know as we're gathering from different uh, organization is to think about maybe three important things that i feel uh, could could uh, could uh, uh, be uh, relevant to the discussion today that we have and uh, that we will have in these three days one of them is i think is is the collaboration i feel not I feel, but this is, I think uh, everyone have that, uh, you know, uh, uh, looking at it from, 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 uh, from a collaborative point of view, everyone realized that we don't have that sense of collaboration. We, we don't, uh, roles and responsibilities, so I think, I think what we need maybe to discuss, and I hope that people take, take it to their organization, contribute as part of it, is how can we collaborate? Public sector, private sector, societies and other how to you know to collaborate on the creating the right policies a national policy it's not only a, you know, it's not only a policy for the organization it's good to have a policy for organization but sometimes even within the, within the organization we don't have a policy policy for reskilling the and, and getting the right talents in the organization but also i think the the, the most the, the the most important thing for for all of us and this is again important to uh, for our for our economy for our 2040 you know vision is we need to invest on skills of the future we cannot invest only to develop the skills of today that we need yes yes we need to invest on skills of today we need to invest on you know creating the job of you know uh, uh, training uh, putting people on jobs today but i think what what is missing and sometimes it's it's, it's, a, it's a chicken and egg type of you know uh, is it is it talent before or job before? I think for for national for for the economy for the future of the country, I think talents has to come even before the because talents will create jobs. And I think today, if you ask any investor who will come to Oman, you ask him, give me identify two three things that if you I want you to come to Oman, you will come. First thing always will be talents. And we've been I think Dr. Amr and the the team everyone they realize that. In, in this important you know, the sector, especially in the ICT sector, the talents is, is very important. Everyone realized that there is a talent, not talents for today, okay? There is, there is uh, well, Alhamdulillah, Oman is very talented. We have a lot of young, uh, you know, energetic people who are willing to work. But I think what we are uh, يعني, trying to, to say here, we need the talents for the future. And this talents has to be, يعني, يعني we work collaboratively as as country to have a national policy for for for, for this talent today uh, we have a lot of organization responsible for this يعني, for this important uh, يعني, uh, initiative لكن i think uh, we really really need to have 
somebody who will be uh, who will be responsible to to make sure that you know we we talking about attracting investors. We're talking about job cannot be created by government only. You know, jobs government have I think uh, enough talents on them to to, to uh, but the private sector, the new pro projects that will attract, attract investors investor to, to come to Oman, and young people who can be uh, be available as a talent. For the for the other countries or for other uh, for the region for the for global for global market, those are the talents that will bring value to the to to, to Oman. So I think I mean, collaboration, putting the right policy, uh, investing on on the future talents. I think this is a key areas. I'm 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 sure that a lot of discussion will be around some of these topics and other topics. I'm sure HRD is a very big also a very big topic and. Uh, I'll be really delighted also to learn from the speaker, to learn from every one of you in this in this important topic. Thank you very much for uh, for having me. Thank you very much for for this opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Salem Al Razehi, Chairman of the Board, Oman Information Technology Society. We certainly look forward to working with you and to your vision to driving Oman to a leader in the region and the world in information communication technology. Our next keynote speaker needs no introduction. He is Dr. Amir Rawas. Dr. Amir, personally, I've known him since he was a professor at the University Sultan Khabus, and he has an exemplary leadership, a successful track, and I'll say a few words to introduce him. He's a transformation leader who specializes in artificial intelligence. From a time when we did not hear the word artificial intelligence, he has been educated and working in this area. He works in advanced technologies and innovation. He serves as a consultant for international entities like the United Nations. He serves as a consultant for international agencies and provides advice and guidance on digital transformation and leadership development. During the long corporate career which Dr. Amir had after his academic career, and he goes back to academics again. Dr. Amr had the pleasure to work in the advancement of several industries in Oman and the region, including telecommunications. We've known him as the CEO of Oman Tel, and he also is the chairman of Oman Society for Petroleum Services. He's worked in the oil and gas industry, solar renewable energy, and industrial development, education included. He's on the board of Oman Academic Accreditation Authority and Quality Assurance, Oman Education Council. Dr. Amir holds a PhD in Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence from Sussex University, UK. Currently, he's a non-resident dean of the School of Information Technology and Business at New Vision University, Georgia. Without further delay, I welcome Dr. Amir Rawas. Thank you so much. Thank you, Saad, for a generous introduction. Thank you very much. Your Excellency, Bukhit uh, Amri, Excellencies, Ambassadors, Business Leaders, uh, Dear Delegates, Salaam Alaikum and good morning to everyone. Uh, thanks to His Excellency, Dr. Salam al -Zayqi. He's uh, set the scene for us to basically now start the real business. But I will uh, maybe start light by just introducing the scene that uh, I hope that all the more qualified, uh, less rusty than I, uh, experts in the uh, delegates will be covering along with the scholars who are going to be uh, presenting. So allow me to start without further ado. Now, uh, I'm not gonna bore you with too many statistics because I'm, I know the professionals that will come will probably give you more recent statistics with perhaps more recent quotes on implications of statistics. Uh, this is uh, not working, so which, oh yeah, it's now working. So maybe I'll start with storytelling, just reminding you. As humans, we have proven time after time that we have short memory. And I think people like, you know, used to me moving, so maybe I should start moving. So yeah, uh, let's start with, uh, with the history, uh, storytelling. Uh, we've forgotten that over the last 250 years, we've been through 
three revolutions and now the fourth that we're just uh, you know the imminent one is the fourth one i think we've already stepped in but we like to talk about it as the next trip we like to look forward to it or uh, afraid of it as uh, some scholars have said so i'm going to talk a little bit about the social impact as well as the economic impact not the technologies that were introduced in those revolutions so around 250 years ago, we had we had the revolution, which is the first industrial revolution, which had a major impact. And it wasn't the civil war in the U.S., which had the uh, you know huge uh, civil uh, uh, rights impact. However, the more important impact that now industries moved from the rural areas to the big cities. So there was urban migrations. People used to make things at home. You know, the local uh, carpenter, the local smith will make all the tools and then they will take them to the city to sell them. What happened with this first revolution? No, things are not coming from the villages anymore. Things are being built in the cities. So people migrated to the cities. Huge urban migration happened around the world, but particularly the, the Western world where this all started. In the second revolution, with the uh, advent of the lifts, when we created the lifts, yet even more urban migration came. People who couldn't afford a, a villa or a castle in the city now could live in an apartment because thanks to the, this, the second revolution, we have the lifts. We can go, can up, go up to uh, as, as many, many floors, floors as, as we, we want, want to. to. So, so new people moved in. That also had uh, and in, uh, in the link with the uh, third industrial revolution, an impact on how we live as a society and created individualism. Now people can live alone. You move from a village to the city and you live alone. So uh, society changed as we know it. And the advent of what was called yuppies at the time in, in the 80s, early 80s, this term started where young urban professionals will move from the villages to the city and live on their own and live for their own. They were called the selfish uh, segment of society. So they make money, they spend it on themselves, they have their own luxury flat, their own sports car and so on. That was the, the yuppies culture at the time. And then we moved on to the creation of yet another change in society because uh, uh, don't worry I'll bring you back to HR because the uh, society uh, I mean HR is based on uh, human resources and human resources what is what makes up our society so we created a new uh, segment uh, called dinks dual income no kids so these are two urban professionals who moved to the city decided to get married but because they're after growing their career, they don't want to have kids. So they delay the kids part in order to pursue career. These people needed different things, needed a different environment of work. But those who decide to have kids, also they want a different environment of work from the HR. They want flexible hours. Mothers who are uh, uh, breastfeeding uh, uh, inf uh, infants want to go home early, want to spend time with their kids, want to work from home. Technology did not enable it then. It does enable it now, uh, especially after, after COVID. Now, what will the fourth industrial revolution uh, bring in terms of societal impact? Most scholars say it will turn us into a leisure society there will simply not be enough work for us as humans, as all these machines that will be created around us will be doing most of the work, especially as Amr and His Excellency Dr. Salem mentioned, all the repetitive work will be done by, uh, uh, you know, uh, I also say the intrusive work as well. Work, we, you know, sometimes we don't want people to come into our lives. We would welcome a robot uh, hoping that the robot will not talk about what he sees in our house to other robots. Uh, but the idea is we don't like intrusiveness and machines will not only take repetitive, boring jobs, they'll also take 
systematic complex jobs as well as intrusive jobs. So when all these machines around us take most of the work, we will have much more time to, to uh, have leisure and to enjoy ourselves. But that in itself will create other jobs and other entrepreneurial opportunities because you go for a lifestyle product when you go for leisure. You go, let's say, to dining out. I was talking to uh, RC yesterday that, uh, CR, sorry, that we are now witnessing in India, for example, that uh, dinks, dual income, no kids, they go to eat outside four times a week. That is not something that has been part of the Indian culture, right? So, and, and, and this, uh, this uh, basically goes to confirm what Dr. Salem said, that, okay, some jobs will go, but new jobs of a different, uh, you know, type, especially leisure, more leisure and service type will be created. So, in short, human will be freed to do what they do best. And we have to decide what is that. And we'll leave that for you to talk about and uh, in the rest of the conference. So let me talk about the impact of one technology. So away from statistics, just one example of how one technology can change uh, the scene in the workplace in many, many jobs. So the driverless, uh, driverless cars, the autonomous cars, I like to call them autonomous cars. What do they do? Not only they uh, basically free us up, they uh, replace the trains. I remember uh, I lived in England for 12 years. I remember, you know, when I used to go to Brighton by car, my British friends criticized me. You know, why can't you take the train? You could read in the train. So I tried it. And it's a totally different experience. You read on your way up, you you read on your way down and it becomes much more useful, much more functional, uh, especially if you're a researcher, you need to read. And at the time it was very useful. Now, this will also mean, so there, there's no driver, so driver job's gone. Uh, and remember when I was talking, Your Excellency, to Minister of Labor about five years ago about this, uh, they said we have 43,000 drivers in Oman, full-time jobs. And people have stayed, what are we going to do with those? If we have, uh, you know, trucks now being driven, uh, self-driven, hopefully uh, not in the next uh, five years in Oman, uh, but we'll have to find a solution soon. But not only that, it would also take away the, uh, the car dealership, you know, because now you don't have to own the car. You can go to work in a car like this, and you can lease it online. It will come to you and pick you up and take you to work every day. You can also choose to pool with other people. Another societal change in the past, people, you know, parents told us don't mix with strangers. Now the car will suggest, why don't you save money and we take someone else? And uh, most people will agree because carpooling has become a culture. Now you go to work on this, but you go for your date in a car like this or for your party, and you don't have to own it, right? So you book another car to pick you up to the date, and you don't have to worry about parking it, all the valet parking people have gone, right? And so just going now to the jobs. So the salesman jobs, this is the guy, the guy with the gray hair, the one that convinces you to buy the car. That he's got a job. The next guy who makes it difficult for you to buy the car, the finance guy. The, the car leasing finance company guy, he might lose his job too if you are not buying cars anymore. So car leasing industry will also be affected. Next, uh, and this is how it's going to be affected. You're gonna book your car online, depending on your purpose, your occasion, uh, the number of uh, family members that you're going to, to carry, you know, the, uh, everything, the color, you pick the car and it comes to you. But next to that also, the people who work in the after sale of cars will also be reduced significantly because all new electrical self-driven cars will have very, very few mechanical moving parts. Other than the wheels, it will be the suspension. 
So the suspension is the future of mechanics and all other mechanics will have to find jobs elsewhere, maybe short term in the, uh, uh, you know, in the, uh, let's say, oil and gas industry. But they say even the, uh, the people who do body work, not only the mechanics, will be less because they're hoping that smart, self-driven cars will have less accidents than uh, wild drivers in the street. So uh, this way, this is just one industry. And you can see one technology, how it's already affected us. This is why, uh, I'm sorry, I think I'm going trigger happy with this. So uh, this is an interesting quote from Thomas Friedman. Mother nature works in a way such that those who survive are not necessarily the smartest or the strongest, but the most adaptive. So uh, Dr. Salem mentioned the word adaptability and so did Amr this morning. It's very important and I hope it forms a uh, central part of your discussion for the next three days. So it's all about adaptability. Now, we've talked in the past about IQ and you know, we are all tested on IQ for our jobs. When I got a job in America, I was tested in, in, in IQ before I went to America. I was still in England, so they tested me online on IQ, so that was the, the thing that gets you in. But theory says IQ gets you in, EQ gets you, uh, you know, promoted uh, in the jobs. So you had the IQ and the EQ. Now, adaptability quotient is the most important thing going forward, the ability to adapt. So adaptability intelligence is the future. And adaptability, unlike the others where are, uh, you know, we talk about uh, uh, IQ as an individual IQ, EQ as an individual um, EQ, emotional intelligence. But when we talk about adaptability intelligence, we're talking about ad adaptability at different layers. We're talking at adaptability at the organizational layer, at the team layer, but also, and most importantly, at the leader layer. Most of leaders, most leaders that lead now are, are from, from the, the X generation. generation. That, that means my generation. Uh, X doesn't mean cross it out, it just means X. So the X generation is leading Y generation and millennials. So they have to adapt their leadership style in order to be able to continue to inspire uh, the productivity of Y generation people. And last but not least is the individual. The individual is the nucleus of society as we talked earlier, but also of any productive uh, entity, be it an organization, a team or an individual. Okay, I'm gonna skip this one because Dr. Salem and uh, Amr covered the statistics. Now, what other changes are happening? So we talked about how technology changes society, but economists and businessmen have changed the way they work. Most of the innovation that has happened in the last 30 years has not been innovation in products and services. There's been innovation in business models. Uh, Uber is not a product innovation. It's the same cars, same driver in terms of the service. So same product, same service, but the business model innovation is what transformed the whole industry of transport, of conveyance, for, for example. Now, the sharing economy principally says that I can borrow for a certain time something that you have as an equipment which is idle, and I can make use of it. It all started, if someone remembers, uh, from about 15 years ago, an app in England called uh, What's Mine is Yours. So if I had a lawn mower in the neighborhood, you don't have to buy a lawn mower. You can borrow mine when you need it, provided that you put on the same app something else that you have, uh, perhaps a trailer that I don't, I don't have, have and, I and I can use, use it. So what's, what's mine is yours started this whole revolution of the shared economy. We all have things that we don't use. I bet you some people even have cars that the, the driver goes to switch on and just move front and forward just to keep those uh, alive. 
what if those cars can be rented the same way we showed there in terms, and there will be services to take your assets and rent it to others and supply it to others. The shared economy is basically even moved us as human to be used part time. And that will come later. So it introduced a very important concept. It's not business to consumer anymore. It's consumer to consumer. I'm agreeing directly as an end user with another end user to use my equipment, perhaps for a fee or for a return, a barter return. return. So temporary access to services, physical goods and assets that you don't own. You don't have to own. So this whole sense of ownership is gone in the shared economy. And it's going to be increasing. People that are that made their money on selling commodities are going to be impacted the most by the fourth industrial revolution. Now, the gig economy is a result of the share, shared. Uh, I mean, the gig uh, work, work economy is a result of the shared economy. People go for a, a part of time. It started from, uh, the word came from gigs when people go and sing in, in a bar or in a lobby of a hotel or uh, be honest, can play in a hotel, that's a gig. And now people do that for many other jobs, many other skills. And they do the job and they get paid for the time that they delivered the service with their unique skill and they're paid according to skill. So they are freelancers. They're independent contractors, they contract directly. They are project-based, you come and do your gig and go. Uh, temporary and part-time hires is something that I know the government is regulating and it's now increasing. Task-oriented, I called it here assignees because in my previous lectures a few years ago, I was calling it task-oriented employment. But people are worried about you know, employing people and then moving them around, so assignees. You just assign them a task, they get paid for the task. The task can be repetitive. So if you have an accountant that you will, will do your monthly accounts, can come at a certain time of the, a month to do your accounts and leave to do another company's accounts. So these are assignees, they're not necessarily employees that will be looked after by the HR uh, development officers or, or leaders that we have with us today. Now, the gig economy is a lonely affair where you are working independent from a corporation. So you lose the support of the corporation. And in this kind of uh, environment, you produce or perish. If you don't produce, you go. And therefore, individual productivity will go up. Hence, what I said earlier, that there will not be enough work if individual productivity goes up, if machines take a lot of the work, then the number of working hours has to go down. And I know that England is considering a four day week. There is some, uh, I think the Labour Party is lo uh, looking at a four day weeks and Your Excellency, we have the uh, Korean ambassador here. I think Korea is also looking at compensating or uh, asking companies that automate work to pay some tax in order to provide employment for others. So people are already preparing from a regulatory point of view for this kind of change. So the gig worker has to be skilled in everything. And there's one very important part I wanna talk about is the social skill. They need to be able to please the customer because if you're someone working for a big organization, right, what, what do you do? You basically, if you're an engineer in Amantel, you don't worry about the pleasing the customer, you just deliver the service through the system. But somebody else pleases the customer, somebody else uh, builds the customer and so on. I tried to work in the gig economy, it was very difficult. The most difficult thing for me was to build and collect. It's very embarrassing to say, you know, to a company in Holland, look, I did give you a presentation in 2016, you haven't paid me yet. So it's, you need to do that on your own now in the gig economy. It can become very lonely, but you need a social skill to keep the customers coming back to you. And then in the gig economy, it's very difficult to scale up. There's only one of you. So how do you scale up? 
you create a reputation. So you need to have also a marketing and branding experience. And by your reputation, for example, if you are a master uh, a plumber, then many other plumbers, that's not to say that uh, the people who operate in the gig economy are all plumbers, but a simple example is a plumber. You can't be plumbing the whole neighborhood. You could do the difficult jobs and then assign other jobs under your brand, under your name to uh, younger or less experienced plumbers. So you create jobs for others. Because some people say that it's all about individualism. The gig economy will not create jobs. No, the trust, it's all about legitimacy and trust and uh, rating. If people rate you really high, they will trust whoever comes through you. Okay, now back to HR. Now, who is the employer when you are working for Uber? Who's the employer? The employer is the app, right? But is the app the boss? But people ask the people who work for these apps, who actually, you know, the people who are Uber drivers are, uh, you can call them gig economy players because he's working with his time. He chooses when to work and he has to handle the relationship with the passenger and he gets the money from Uber, right? So now who, do you think is the boss? The new boss, the real boss is the customer. Customers have now been spoiled by the Uber and likes. They have to, they can choose. They can kind of cross you and choose the next driver if they want. And they can rate you. They can decide to tip you or not to tip you. They can report you. They can choose what car, what color, right? They can cancel, that's very important as well. As long as they can pay for it. There's so much freedom is now with the, uh, the customer. And if there are enough customers that complained about you, you don't need HR to fire you. The app will fire you. The app is the employer. The app will fire you without consulting HR or legal uh, uh, affairs or the Ministry of Labor. They will just fire you you will be crossed, blacklisted from the app. Okay, so is HR ready? Now this is, the, this is what you need to talk about. Uh, is HR ready for a time when we will be using human as a service? In, in our industry, uh, Dr. Salomo testified that we use software as a service. Now we're talking today about human as a service. If we're gonna use them part-time here, part-time there, we're gonna use them to deliver something for us or to do a task for us. It's human as a service, right? Is HR ready to manage human as a service? But do we need HR? That's another question that some scholars are asking about because only a few years ago, we didn't have HR. Actually, it was called something else. I think most of the people in the front row, excuse me, were hired by personnel, not by HR. Uh, yeah, if you remember. So uh, HR, was <laughs> sabotage. <laughs> so uh, uh, HR is the new thing. This is a recent picture after the invention of camera, of course, uh, of people queuing to take their daily rates. Doesn't that ring a bell when you talk about freelancing and gig economy, you work for yourself for your day, you get paid for, for your day. You don't have a real relationship with the organization. HR doesn't get into it, right? They just, there's payroll maybe, but not HR, not full-fledged HR. Somebody recruits you and normally it's the business uh, owner or the foreman, uh, the business side sort of hires you for the right job. If you're big and strong, they hire you to lift stuff. And then you get paid at the end of the day. And that was quite recent. So it's, it's, is HR come and gone or can we reform HR? That's something that we need to talk about over the next three days. Uh, many people have been to many conferences uh, recently online and then uh, more recently in Europe, uh, three conferences. People worry too much and take too long to talk about what leads to what. Does society change leads to adapting technology? Does technology leads to society change? 
how, let's not worry about that. Let's talk about embracing change and moving along. Here, more in the GCC, we went through what I call the building the nation stage, which is the infrastructure stage. We didn't have all these roads and airports, ports and everything. So we had to build all of that. That required a different set of skills. I have dealt with HR people who have hired 3,000 staff. Uh, OK, and next phase, if you consider Dubai as an example, and uh, Doha, they have built everything. Now they are doing the service stage. People come to enjoy all the big hotels, the big airports, the events that happen in these two towns. So they hire people now to provide that service, right? So we've now been in the service stage. The next stage is the experience phase. So we're moving from the building the nation, which is the infrastructure stage, the service stage, and into the experience. How do we create a new, enjoyable, uh, uh, you know, leisure oriented kind of experience for everyone. As, as we said, the new culture will be a leisure culture. If I have a good experience at your company, I'm going to come back. So the new uh, culture is going to be all about the work culture, about providing an experience. Uh, that's just to prove that uh, we're not with, with 3D printing, we're not going to need all those people to build. So it's not going to be about quantity. It's about what talent, as Dr. Salem said. Who do we choose? And as I said earlier, we choose people who are adaptable. Um, in Oman, so that we bring it along, uh, Dr. Fatma, uh, it's, she's actually was at your, uh, your ministry, Your Excellency. Dr. Fatma Hajri and I did research on uh, the yuppies and dinks in Oman. And we found that those segments are growing. And uh, if you just show the picture again, it's just pictures and we close. And so that was uh, uh, the one earlier was the uh, yuppies uh, who just come from the villages to work in Muscat and they don't get married, right? And then we had the dinks and we, we have seen growth in both in the yuppies and uh, dinks in Oman. So, what has happened in the West in the 80s is happening to us now, and we have the numbers to prove it in a research. The change is coming. I think who does the work, how work gets done, is the question that, that HR, HR leaders, leaders have, have to discuss, discuss and answer during, during this conference. And the kind of people we're going to be bringing, not necessarily those kind of workers, people who can work, with, they don't have to come to Oman. They will work with us from abroad. They're, they're gonna collaborate. So it's all about international collaboration. Uh, on, on terms of, uh, uh, you know, um, diversity and inclusion, females are going to be able to do jobs that are traditionally done by men because technology will allow them that access, like joystick robotics. And also diversity and inclusion, you're gonna need the skills of all those people and the knowledge of all those people from different nationalities, different age groups. When we talk about uh, you know, uh, diversity, often we only consider gender and nationality, but age is a very important uh, generational gap when it comes to diversity and inclusion. You have to have in every team a diversity in ages in order to fulfill the whole experience that they're trying to create. So uh, how do you get there? Imagination, creativity. Uh, I remember Professor Thornton, one of my AI professors in Sussex University, said the main thing that separates us as human from other intelligent animals is our ability to imagine. And we should foster more imagination uh, CR and I yesterday over dinner, we're talking about how do we foster imagination in big organizations. We are talking about a specific big organization in India. How do we foster imagination and creativity? You know, imagination is what gets you from there to there. And you know, the AirPods is the highest margin for Apple. It's not the iPhone. It's just someone that sees something and imagine how it could be 
done easier through innovation. And because imagination is the source of uh, the true intelligence that this source. We've already talked about the numbers that need to be reskilled. I think Amr put 100 and uh, uh, 50, 20 million. Yeah, 120 million based on IBM. I think 50% of skills, skills will have to be uh, over time uh, changed. So mastering the art of learning is very important. We need to master the art of learning and relearning, reskilling. That's what the uh, top 25 skills. I think emotional intelligence will prevail over the next few years because that's where you create the experience. Uh, you either create it through the human to human interaction or through the devices and algorithms and machines that you create, apps that you create should have some emotional intelligence feed. Last slide, the new KPIs for leaders is to keep people inspired. That is the true KPI going forward for leaders keep people inspired to continue to innovate and improve productivity and experience to your customers. Thank you all very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Amar. As uh, most of you may know, we organize COMEX, the technology show of Oman, as well as GEDEX, the higher education show of Oman for 20 years. And as Dr. Amar Rawas said, I've been talking to some leading international universities, and they've been planning to open MSc in Curiosity, MSc in Critical Thinking. So these are the new courses coming up. So this is something very different. We could not have imagined five years ago that there will be an MSc in Curiosity. Thank you so much, Dr. Amr. Our next keynote speaker will be Dr. Abdullah Saleh Babud. Dr. Abdullah is an Omani academic and researcher who served as the previous head of Qatar University Center for Gulf Studies. He graduated with a PhD from the University of Cambridge, and he also has a master's degree in international relations. His research interests are international relations, education, and he has worked, not only graduated, but worked at the Cambridge University at the National University in Singapore. And currently, we are happy to have him as he works for University of Waseda, Japan. Dr. Babud has been on the European universities and institutions, and he has authored several books, journals, and conference papers. Today, we would like to invite Dr. Abdullah Babud to speak about study in Oman, and how an Omani institution, university, college, or even schools can become attractive to international students. Dr. Abdullah Babud. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, Your uh, Excellency, uh, Dr. Bakhid Al-Mahri, uh, distinguished guests um, and speakers, good morning to you all. It's a, a real challenge to speak after those prominent speakers, Dr. Salem and Dr. Amr. I very much enjoyed your, uh, your presentations, and thank you very much for uh, those thoughts um, and, and your insights. Um, so I've, I have been asked to speak about how to study in Oman, and I'm the wrong person to be speaking about that, simply because I hardly studied in Oman. Uh, I left Oman when I was very young. Um, I was 10 years old when I uh, left Oman, um, grade five, and I've been a lost soul since then, um, studying and working abroad. Um, but maybe they asked me to speak about studying in Oman so that um, to see it from the outside, to reflect from, uh, from the outside, and perhaps they wanted to have a different uh, opinion about studying in Oman. But before I speak about studying in Oman, let me just, uh, just say one or two things about um, future skills. And I agree with the previous uh, presentations and speakers uh, that, you know, that the future is not only here, 
the future um, is with us, but the future is in our hands. What we plan today is going to be our future tomorrow. And the skills that we teach today in the universities are going to be the skills that our next generation will be able to um, use in, in their future jobs. And let me just look around and see that, you know, many of you have studied well, went to university, succeeded, and got your degrees. But many, how many of you work on the same topic or subject that uh, your qualification says that you have, um, um, that you have gained? For example, we see engineers working in finance, um, lawyers working in marketing, and, and so on. So, um, not only that, but how many of you with a degree, especially the young generation I can see in the back, how many of you with your degree and your very, very important piece of paper that you worked very hard have managed to get jobs? And why? Why didn't you get, manage to get jobs? Is it, of course, there is um, economic recession globally. Of course, there is a um, fall in the oil price and the, uh, uh, affecting uh, the Gulf states' um, economy. Uh, of course, there is COVID, but there is more to it. Your degree and the three or four years that you have worked in the college or the university doesn't match the skills that are needed today. And this is what this event is trying to address, is the skills for the future. Because those courses that you have done in the universities, they have been designed about 20, 30 years ago, and then hardly changed or updated. People, teachers like me, come and get the syllabus, and they reuse them. And they continue to do so. And they teach you things that have been um, outdated in many ways. To give you an example, uh, my daughter was asked to come and teach cybersecurity at Sultan Qaboos University. My daughter is Amr's sister, elder sister. So she went there and they gave her the syllabus. And she couldn't believe herself when she read the syllabus that were taught to our students in Sultan Qaboos University. They were outdated. They don't even teach them at um, international universities. So she wanted to give up straight away. I'm not gonna teach this, this is crazy, I can't do it. And I said to her, look, th the thing to do is to tear them off and start writing your own syllabus and go and talk to the college or to whoever's ever responsible there, the dean, the head of uh, the program, and, um, and uh, convince them that this is the syllabus that they have to, to do. Uh, this is not just an example of Sultan Qaboos University. It's an example across universities across the world. I have worked in different universities, uh, as uh, Sadak had mentioned, and I have seen this. And faculty and teachers are overwhelmed. They work very hard. Uh, it's the worst job to, to choose for your, your uh, career, to be an academic. Uh, because you really have to work much harder than others. And you have to publish. And, you know, they say publish or perish, uh, as, it, as it were. So, what I'm trying to say here is that the world is changing, as it's been uh, heard before. And the technology is here with us now, uh, as you've also heard, and how the technology is changing our lives. But this change because of this technology is, change, is making that, um, that change pace much quicker than what we can think. And we 
us academics in whatever discipline haven't been able to keep up with uh, uh, technology. And we haven't been able to master it and to make it more innovative. We are only trying to catch up and use it uh, uh, in one way or the other. And we are still teaching our young generations things that, they, that we have designed 20, 30 years ago, but still using, uh, but maybe uh, improved by adding technology into it. But that is not the university of the future. That is not the college of the future. And that is not, we are not equipping our next generation with the skills for the future. What are the skills of the future? I think uh, you guys, uh, previous speakers, have answered to it. It's very difficult to tell what are going to be the skills for the future. Because, you know, the nature of the job market is changing. The demands for different skills are changing. But there are certain things that we can equip our uh, young people with. Obviously, we have to teach them the math, the sciences, and, you know, the social sciences and all of that. Um, but we have also to have to teach them how to be adaptable, how to be agile, how to uh, think on their feet, how to uh, do teamwork, uh, how to be good communicators. We have to teach them and help them to have the skills to be able to go to the workplace and succeed. I don't think many universities offer this, by, by the way. And I'm not just talking about Oman or the Gulf. I've seen it in different parts of the world. There are some universities that do that and, and have succeeded, but many universities have not been able to, to do so. They are still very traditional on their offering of courses. And the students go with this degree, having spent three, four years, and spend their families fortune and hard work and still can't get a job. So I think this is a really good time to reflect on what we want to do, what are the future skills, what are the future, what is the future university, what is education going to look like uh, in the future. Education is changing in, in many ways. I went to um, get my new job in Japan at Waseda University uh, and I landed uh, in the morning and I went into uh, a quarantine uh, in a very small room in Japan. And uh, if you, for those people who haven't uh, lived in Japan, they can uh, per perhaps appreciate how small the rooms are. And I couldn't even open my own suitcase uh, in the room. And the next day I had to teach. And of course I wasn't allowed to leave my room. And so what did I do? Use technology. Obviously, COVID has changed the way that we think, has changed our lives. So I had to switch my laptop and get into the university system. And there I was teaching my students in the course. Of course, I didn't see them. I didn't know who they were. I can't even remember their names. I can't even pronounce some of their names uh, because they're so difficult. Different culture, different names. And it was very challenging for me to do so. You know, you're talking to yourself uh, almost on the screen. And it took me some time um, after I finished the quarantine to go to the university, but then the system was not allowing many students to come, so I had to go for a hybrid system. And then I realized that I was teaching in Tokyo students based in Korea, Your Excellency. In, and they were switching their laptops from Korea. I was teaching students in China and Indonesia and the Middle East and also in Europe. And they are all students in a Japanese university. So what makes these 
students come to Japan. And I think this is what you want me to talk about, Sadak. <laughs> so what makes these students come to Japan? And what makes them, when I was in Singapore, what makes them come to the uh, uh, Singapore National University, for example? Obviously, there are a number of reasons for it. And I think you have slide, yes? One of them is, of course, the quality of education. We cannot beat that. We cannot beat the quality of education and the reputation of the university. But if we think that universities, I can't even read it, <laughs> but if we think that universities are, um, are constant and there are top universities in the world and that's it, and people will go to, um, oh, um, I think it's here, all right. If we think that universities are, um, um, you know, there are uh, leaders in universities and that's, that's the, the way it is and people will only go to these top universities, I think we are mistaken. Because universities' ranking keep changing and universities' reputation also change. Leadership matters in these universities. Some leaderships don't do as well. I will give you a small example. I was working in Cambridge. I think Dr. Amr, you came several times to visit uh, and we organized some events there. In the 80s, the British government decided to give some of the universities some funding to create business schools. So they offered it to all the British universities. Of course, Oxford and Cambridge said no. How can we take money to teach business? This is the profession. We teach philosophy, we teach economics, uh, we teach um, history, we teach engineering, medicine, but business? No. They refused to take the money. University, Manchester University was of the, one of the first universities to take that funding from the British government and created a very successful business school. Uh, London University did the same and they created a very successful London business school and some other universities. And later on, these two traditional old age universities started to think that we are losing Students, and not only we are losing students, we are losing our future graduates who are going to be leading businesses in the future, who are going to be helping us to fund these universities, are going to these universities and not to us. And therefore, we have to build business schools, but they didn't have the money. As you know, universities are always um, seeking funding. Um, so they didn't have the money and the government has given the money away. So they had to wait until a graduate from Cambridge called Paul Judge gave them 20 million pounds to, uh, and that's where we organize our events, if you recall, Dr. Ahmed, to build the business school. And he was a very successful uh, young man who graduated from Cambridge and uh, did well um, in South um, uh, Africa and they called the school after him. It's called the Judge Business School. Oxford had to wait as well until someone called Said Tawfiq, originally Arab, came with the money and offered it to uh, University of Oxford and they called it Said Business School. How many people here in Oman can dream of donating money to one of the universities here? And will the law and the system allow for this uh, school or program to be called after their names? It's not happening. It will not happen because we, our system has not changed, has not evolved to be able to take that into consideration. I am sure there are people who want to support that, but we don't have it yet in Oman. 
any university, and the future of universities, we said, is changing. Um, you know, COVID has really made us think now what uh, uh, is going to happen. Is the traditional university with its buildings and so on is going to be the norm? People now can be in their own hometown and learn and get a degree from um, universities abroad. So what is this going to happen to the way education is developing? All of these questions need to be addressed. The skills that we, we teach, the topics that we teach, the curriculum that we have decided, that we have designed 20, 30 years ago needs to be changed. The programs, the offering, etc., needs to be changed. And it needs to be changed now. We cannot wait if we want to be ahead of the game. When I was working in the University of Singapore, Singapore is a very small country, as you know. I was always told that they used to tell me, Abdullah, we have to be ahead of the curve all the time. We cannot, for a moment, relax. We have to be the ahead of everybody. And therefore, we have to be innovative in, in what we offer and what we do. And of course, you can see what you know, um, the National University of Singapore uh, uh, is doing and how successful it has been. And they, they have developed almost the same time as, as our countries in the Middle East. But you know, look at their universities in, uh, in Singapore. Um, of course, you know, talking about Korea is another uh, successful example. Uh, Japan was, of course, the leader in this, but of course, it, would, it was caught up by other, uh, other countries. So, how, what makes a successful university? Of course, what we know is the out research output. There are obviously ranking that are, um, uh, happens uh, uh, around the world, and there are a number of ranking agencies, etc. So if we want to attract students, we want to be uh, a well-known university with good um, uh, research and, and uh, publication uh, that attracts citation, etc. Um, but can we do that? Do we have enough faculty to be able to do research? Research requires funding. Do we have enough funding? We have to be innovative. We don't have it. Let's be honest with ourselves. It does, it costs a lot to do research. But there are many ways that you can do it. You don't have to just think inside the box. In fact, you don't even have to think outside the box. You've got to think with no box at all. And that's how you start to think uh, and, and see the world differently. And you can attract funding for research in certain areas if you know how to go about it. And I think it's been mentioned by my colleagues, collaboration. Now universities are collaborating, researchers are collaborating around the world. So we need to think just be, you know, outside our box and think about Oman and getting funding from Oman. We have to think about getting funding from different universities and different countries that offer uh, uh, research. Um, we need to be um, able to, you know, uh, build partnership. Um, we need to have accreditation equ equivalents. Uh, we have to also, you know, work on indexing. And I'll go through this very quickly uh, that Sadak and his team has prepared. Um, and they want me to talk about it. Uh, but it is there in front of you. All of these um, uh, items here, uh, 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 we, we, we need to do. And I apologize, but I, I tend to get, uh, go outside the text and I don't like to be contained within uh, this, but of course you can read what uh, excellence in education uh, means. But excellence in education, first and foremost, is how successful are your graduates. And that is important. And if you teach them curriculum, and programs that have been designed 20, 30 years ago and hardly been upgraded, they're not gonna be successful. They're not gonna be catching up with the new trends 
and the, the future skills that are, are required. And you cannot teach them all the future skills as well, as you know, because who knows what the future skills are going to be. But you can equip them with the, the skills and the tools to be able to learn and to have a good grounding, but also to retrain and to reskill and to upskill uh, as well. And that is, uh, that is needed badly uh, here. We tend to just teach students uh, in the Middle East uh, by root memorizing or, you know, just trying to remember a few things and that's it. And not to think on their selves, on their own feet, and to be able to develop their own critical thinking and analytical thinking. We have to, to help the students to be free, to think outside the box, to think with no box. We have to grade them the way that we, we create the syllables and the way that we create the programs is something that is really important because that is what you are teaching to the students. Um, also, what will attract students to come to Oman? Why should I, living in India or in a um, neighboring country, come to Oman? I don't think there are many good reasons. Yes, you agree? I disagree. I think there are some good reasons. People now are looking for different experiences. Even if you were born in the United States or uh, Europe, you want to go and learn somewhere else. You want to have a different experience. I keep um, telling my children, go and study anywhere uh, in the world. Learn different language, learn different skills, um, and different cultures. So yes, on the face of it, Yes, not many people want to come to Oman because we don't have high-ranking universities. But people don't just look for high-ranking universities. There are other reasons that people uh, want to go and study abroad. Like, for example, um, you know, as I said, the experience, the offering. And if our universities are still offering the traditional programs and the traditional degrees, they are not, you're not going to attract many people. You need to offer some new, unique, niche programs. And this is where the universities start to think. When I was in Qatar universities, one of the things we decided to do, and I come from a social sciences, not like my colleagues from natural sciences, is to offer, um, I have an international relations degree, but I also have a business administration, masters and, and, and masters and international relations as well. And my background is business. So we wanted to offer um, international relations degree, a master's and a PhD. But how are we going to compete with the rest of the world? If you want to do international relations, you don't want to come to Oman or Qatar or the UAE or anywhere. You know, there are top universities that do that. So we offered Gulf Studies. It's a very unique program, a very niche program. And it's become so popular that it was like one of the most important programs within the universities. We had something like 30 different nationalities in the, in, in the program. Our graduates are now the leading um, scholars in the region and experts in the region. What does Oman have to offer? Stability and security is very important. Many people are looking for, uh, for their children to go to a stable and secure place. And Oman is a very stable and secure place. Why can't we use that and market it well? For if you are, if you are sending your children, the most important thing is you want to see that. Uh, send them to a stable country. What does Oman also have to offer? The languages. How many Arab countries have the diversity of languages that we have here in Oman, for example. I was listening to a speaker once in London, and she told me only in the far uh, southern region of Oman, there are at least 12 different languages. 
let alone in Muscat and Musandam and Sharqiyya and so on. Language is a very important. Many people spend their time and send their children to go and study languages and the languages study culture. And why do you want these people to come? Because you want them to also learn your culture. They want them, you want them, this is a soft power that you have. And talking about soft power, when the crisis happened in Qatar, for example, during the um, uh, Gulf crisis, the graduates from that program were speaking in different conferences around the world, giving Qatar's viewpoint. And those are not Qataris. And I went to different conferences and I saw these young people, our graduates, speaking about the Gulf crisis and so on, and giving a very um, uh, neutral, if you like, uh, opinion. But yet, they're understanding it from the Qatar point of view because they lived in Qatar and they have a soft spot. So you have a, a soft power that you can use. What can you also benefit from students coming here? You benefit, of course, um, financially. When you bring in people, when you bring in students to the country, it's much more important than tourism, in a way. Because tourists will come for a week, 10 days, maybe more or less, but these students are going to be here at least for two to three years, four, five years, maybe more. You also attract talent because these, some of these students who come and studied here, they may decide to stay and, and work in the country. And why not? If they are good talents and they can create um, wealth for themselves and for the others, why not? Countries like the United States, like the UK, have changed their laws and regulations to be able to attract students. In, even in Japan, which is one of the most restrictive countries in terms of immigration, they have started to ch change their laws. We got to think be outside the box. You cannot take education and you cannot take universities and degrees and, and, uh, and, and policies of attracting young people to Oman in isolation. It has to be related to the, poli the general policies in the country, the general plan. It's not going to be easy. I know how difficult it is in any country, and especially here, as you know. You know, we have entrenched systems, we have bureaucracy, like other countries as well. And if you're talking about bureaucracies, come to Japan. I'll show you how, what it means. It's much, much, much more than what you uh, ever expected and the excellency would know. Um, but you can still work around it. And so what you need to do is you want to work on your compet comparative advantage. We have some comparative advantage. For example, you know, there are other uh, specialties that we can offer. Um, not only in social science, but even in natural sciences. I'm just thinking aloud now, but maybe the study of the deserts or the oceans. Um, uh, desalination, for example. We are the first country to have a Middle East desalination center. Exactly. Uh, all these alternative energies uh, and sustainable energies that we can do. There is potential, but unfortunately, academics like civil servants, they think in silos and they think in lines and they don't and they think outside the box and they don't think without a box or uh, outside the box so what we need to do there is a lot of work and i can spend the whole day talking about what we need to do and i think what we need to do is to have some kind of a uh, uh, an advisory board for the ministry for the education system for uh, the um, um, the whole sector, as it were. And that advisory board, uh, I know that GEDEX is trying to do so. Uh, and we all have to work towards it. And GEDEX is, of course, a private company that works in education and technology and know-how. Uh, but they need your support. And I think it is important that some of you who think that this is something that we need to do in the future, can, can join this uh, education uh, consultancy or advisory board to advise what kind of events 
um, that we, we can do. Advisory board, research centers, research think tanks are very important. People in government, people in policy making, they don't have time to think even. They don't have time to read. And therefore, it is the advisory boards who are young people like yourselves and established people who have the, a little bit more time and there are researchers who can uh, join uh, and, and build you know, think tanks and, um, and, and policy bodies. Unfortunately, we don't have many of those in Oman. But we need to think outside the box and we start to do our, ourselves. The government is doing what it, it can, but the civil society needs to do more. You are the civil society, one way or the other. And we can't just sit there and wait for the government to do so. Governments around the world um, are totally inefficient. Sorry to say that, but that is, you know, it's a global, uh, global thing. Governments are totally inefficient. And, and if you expect that governments are just going to go there and, you know, be the nanny state and deliver everything to you, don't wait for that. Civil societies have to work with the government, have to support the government, have to also direct the government, have to push the government in certain direction. And governments are responsive because they want the best for the country. They want peace, they want uh, prosperity, etc. So it is also up to you, up to us, all of us, to work together to do something. And this advisory board is just one small step towards creating um, a think tank or uh, creating uh, a policy uh, body that can help the education system. And this is not the only one. You can do many of those uh, think tanks and policy making uh, or, or policy advising uh, uh, bodies in the country. I think, Sadak, you're looking at me and I think everybody is ready to go for lunch or or a break, so I have taken a lot of your time, but I tried to give you a little bit of my own experience. I didn't prepare for this, but Sadat asked me to talk about, uh, you know, studying in Oman and also how to do, to, to join this advisory board. And I hope um, I have uh, made uh, something useful. Thank you very much, all of you. Good to see you. Thank you so much, Dr. Abdullah Babut. Professor at the Waseda University, Japan. There's a lot to learn from Omani academic professionals going abroad, like Dr. Rawas, Dr. Babud, and there are many more. Uh, we couldn't bring all of them on the stage. And this is the potential of developing the education economy. And I hope, Oman, um, for what it has achieved in 20 years since I've seen GEDEX and the development of the universities can continue towards the direction of study in Oman. And I did have privilege to study in Strathclyde in Glasgow. I cannot imagine what the Glasgow economy will be without the universities there. It will not function. So we hope in our lifetime we can see Oman become something like Glasgow. It's just my, my personal example.